So for today's webinar, again, the title is Vision, Eye Disease, and the Onset of Problems, the CLSA, uh, presented by Dr. Ellen Freeman. Uh, she is an associate professor in the School of Epidemiology and Public Health at the University of Ottawa. She is also a scientist at the Ottawa Hospital Research Institute. She received her PhD in epidemiology from the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg, Bloomberg School of Public Health. Her research interests focus on better understanding the causes and consequences of visual impairment and eye disease. Now I will pass it along to the presenter. Thank you, Jennifer, for that introduction. I'll just share my screen here. All right, good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to be with here, you here today. Uh, and so let's get started. So um, before we get started with this particular project, I, I just wanted to go over some of my research program themes. So I am an epidemiologist and my research program focuses on the epidemiology of visual impairment and eye disease. And the themes that I have within my research program include determining the frequency of visual impairment and eye disease, so both here in Canada as well as around the world, understanding the risk factors for visual impairment and eye disease, examining the impact of eye disease on things like mobility and mental and physical health, especially in older adults, and developing and testing interventions to try to reduce the impact of eye disease uh, in those populations. And so I just want to start out by going over some background on vision and eye disease. So let's talk first about what is visual function. So what does it mean to see well? So there are different uh, measures of visual function, and most of you are probably familiar with visual acuity. Um, and visual acuity measures how well you see fine details. So visual acuity is typically measured using a white chart with dark black letters that get progressively smaller as you go down the chart. However, much of our world actually exists at lower levels of contrast. And so uh, contrast sensitivity is another measure of visual function that measures how well people see at lower levels of contrast. And it's measured using a white chart with letters that get lighter as you go down the chart, but stay at the same size. Visual field is a measure of how widely you, you can see when you focus on one point. So if you're staring straight ahead, can you see what's going on out here and up here and down here? So all of those are static measures of visual function because you're staring at something that does not move. There are other measures of visual function that are dynamic. So maybe you're asked to identify something that's moving or not and which direction it's moving. And so motion detection is a type of visual function uh, which can be measured by viewing a group of dots in, on the screen and indicating which direction are they moving. And with each successive trial, the movement of the dots gets um, more and more small. And so it's difficult to detect. Um, so let's talk about visual impairment. Um, so when we talk about visual impairment, we're often talking about uh, visual acuity that's below a certain cutoff. And so in countries like Canada and the United States and Australia, we typically define visual impairment for research purposes as visual acuity worse than 2040 vision. Now the World Health Organization does use a different cutoff that's a bit more severe, so they use worse than 2060. And so how big of a problem is visual impairment in Canada? So using CLSA data, my team and I a few years ago published this paper, um, and we found that 5.7% of people in the CLSA had visual impairment using that 2040 cutoff. And as you can see here in the figure, it varied quite a bit by age. So in middle-aged people, visual impairment is not that common. It's about 3%. Uh, but as you get into your 60s, 70s, and 80s, it becomes much more common. So in the oldest age group, about 16% of people had visual impairment. Now, so the CLSA is done in community dwelling adults, but what about the situation in nursing homes? So uh, these data come from the United States, but I, I suspect that the situation is similar here in Canada. So these data come from, um, a sample of about 30 nursing homes in the state of Maryland. 
and this is what they found. So the gray bars indicate uh, visual impairment and the black bars indicate uh, the prevalence of blindness. And so you can see that when you get into older age groups in nursing homes, uh, the majority of people have some uh, visual impairment. Um, and this fits with a, a paper that I worked on with uh, Hélène Kerguat and Marie-Jeanne Kerguat uh, in Quebec a few years ago, where they sent surveys to long-term care homes throughout Quebec. And they found that um, for the majority of homes, uh, you had to request eye care uh, and you had to actually leave the home to get that eye care. And so, you know, that's not ideal. Ideally, you'd have uh, people going in to assess people's vision. Uh, you'd have eye care professionals going into the homes on a regular basis in order to reduce some of this burden. Now, within the community, uh, believe it or not, the leading cause of visual impairment is actually uncorrected refractive error. So that means nearsightedness, farsightedness, astigmatism, presbyopia, uh, things that be, can be collected or corrected just with glasses or contact lenses. And so we see this in study after study uh, around the world in community dwelling adults that, that the leading cause of visual impairment is refractive error. So something that can easily be treated. So other major causes of visual impairment are shown here on this slide. So cataract is shown in pink and it's responsible. It's a major cause of visual impairment as well. And then the other causes of visual impairment do vary a little bit depending on the race or ethnic background of the person. So age-related macular degeneration is shown in blue, uh, glaucoma in yellow and diabetic retinopathy in gray. And so I just want to talk a little bit about some of those causes of visual impairment because I'm going to discuss them later in my analysis. So age-related macular degeneration, which I'm going to call AMD now for short, uh, it is a disease that destroys your central vision. So if you were to look at the photo of the two boys there and you had fairly severe AMD, uh, you would have a hole right where you're fixating. And AMD is typically a bilateral disease. There are two types of AMD. There's wet and there's dry AMD, but both, both types in their advanced stages cause central vision loss. Now, luckily there are some treatments available for wet AMD. And so I meant, I meant to say, uh, age-related macular degeneration affects the macula, which is part of the retina in the back of the eye. And so um, another leading cause of visual impairment is glaucoma. Now, this disease will start at the periphery, so out here. And so you might not even notice it until it gets rather severe. Um, and so it, it, in its more severe stages, it's almost like looking through a tunnel. Um, and this disease is also typically bilateral because it starts in the peripheral vision. Uh, unless you get regular eye care, you may not know you have it. So a lot of people are undiagnosed with glaucoma. And there's different types of glaucoma here in Canada. Primary open angle glaucoma is the most common type. And we do have uh, treatments that involve lowering the eye pressure of the eye, either through eye drops or laser or surgery. And finally, cataract. Uh, is when the lens in your eye becomes cloudy and that leads to blurry or hazy or less colorful vision like shown in the picture here. And luckily we have cataract surgery, which is an excellent surgery that can remove the clouded lens and replace it with an artificial lens. And a bonus of having cataract surgery is that the surgeon can tailor the lens uh, to, be, to, to make it so that you may not need glasses after you have surgery. All right, so now I'd like to give a little bit of background on mobility. <clears throat> so why am I interested in mobility? Well, research shows that mobility loss in older adults may be a preclinical stage of disability. And so I just want to point out this study uh, published in the Journal of the American Medical Association by Newman, and they had people who said that they didn't have any mobility problems. They had them walk 400 meters, so that's once around an outdoor track. And those people who scored in the worst quartile of time to walk that 400 meters, they, over the next five years, had an increased risk of death, cardiovascular disease, mobility limitations, and disability. And so, you know, as an older person, mobility loss could indicate the beginning stages of disability. And so if we think about that in terms of a conceptual framework for um, 
that this project could fit within. So once someone loses their vision, particularly at an older age and develops mobility problems, that can cause all kinds of other adverse health effects. Um, you know, if you start to stop leaving your neighborhood, stop leaving your house because you can't drive and you're, you feel uh, less confident uh, walking around outside of your, your general area around your house, your life is, may become less cognitively interesting, you may become socially isolated, you may get less exercise, and all those things could lead to health problems, obesity, depression, cardiovascular disease. So it could either cause those things or exacerbate those things. And of course, that can put you in a state of disability or nursing home admission or premature mortality. So if we can intervene, if we can understand these pathways and intervene uh, and try to prevent the mobility problems, maybe we can prevent all these things that might stem from mobility problems as well. <clears throat> So how do we go about assessing mobility? So there's no gold standard test. Uh, the right test for your research will depend on your research question and on who's in your sample. And so if you have a sample of people who are hospitalized and they're um, frail, you know, you're going to use a different test than if you have community dwelling middle-aged people. Um, and so it's important to keep that in mind that the right test is gonna depend on your question and your sample. When you think about what kinds of things does a person need to do to have full unassisted mobility? So I mean, mobility without the help of another person or with a technical uh, assistance, you need to be able to maintain your balance. You need to be able to walk you need to be able to get up and down from a chair or bed. You need to be able to take stairs, to drive or take public transportation or get a ride. And so all of those things actually uh, are important, but maintaining balance is, you can't do all the other things on the list unless you can maintain your balance. And so mo balance is really central to mobility. Now, balance is controlled by several systems. So there are three sensory systems that provide uh, feedback to your brain and your central nervous system that your brain then you know, will act and tell your musculoskeletal system to make a compensatory movement so that you don't fall down. And so the three sensory systems are your visual system, your somatosensory system, so your ability to feel the ground with your feet, and your vestibular system. So if you look at this man standing here on one foot doing a yoga pose, you know, all three of those systems are helping him to determine very quickly uh, whether he's maintaining his balance or not. And if he's not, then his brain is telling his uh, ankle muscles and his hip and his lower leg muscles to act and uh, to compensate for that loss of balance. So I just wanna summarize uh, some of the previous research that's been done on vision and balance. And this is certainly not an exhaustive list. Uh, I wanted to focus on some of the prior work that I've done as well as some um, some, I'd say, seminal publications. And so I, I do want to point out a couple years ago, uh, Afshin and I uh, published a paper uh, using the cross-sectional CLSA data, and we found that people with worse acuity uh, were more likely to uh, fail the balance test, and we actually saw an interaction with peripheral vascular disease in that paper. Um, some other work I did um, in 2008 during my postdoctoral work with Sheila West at Wilmer Eye Institute in Baltimore. Uh, this was done using the Salisbury Eye Evaluation Study. So this was made mainly an eye study. And so they measured all kinds of different uh, types of visual function. And so all of those types of visual function that are listed there were associated with worse balance. So worse acuity was associated with worse balance, worse contrast sensitivity. When you put all the vision measures into a model together and tried to see, all right, because a lot of these are correlated with each other, when you put them together, it was actually motion detection that remained significantly related to balance, whereas acuity and contrast sensitivity, sensitivity were no longer significant. Visual field uh, remained significant for one of the types of stands. So visual field and motion detection appeared to be more important than acuity and contrast sensitivity. Um, another study by a different Dr. West um, uh, found that visual field and contrast sensitivity were important. In a study in Australia, 
um, also found contrast sensitivity to be important. So what about um, research looking at particular eye diseases and balance? And so uh, most studies looking at eye disease imbalance have been done in the ophthalmology clinic rather than using a population-based sample. The first two studies uh, here only had glaucoma patients in the sample. So there was no control group without glaucoma. But the study by Pradeep Ramalu at Wilmer, uh, he found that in patients with glaucoma, those people who had more visual field loss had worse balance. And uh, the same thing was found in the Newman study. Now in the Newman study, they looked not at how long you could hold a, a balance uh, stand, but they looked at something a bit more sophisticated called postural sway. And so this, you stand on a platform and they can measure very precisely the amount of sway that you're going back and forth. And it basically confirmed what, um, or it was the same uh, finding that more visual field loss, uh, loss more postural sway. Uh, and then a study that I did in Montreal a few years ago where we had, we compared people with eye disease to people who had relatively normal vision. We found that people with glaucoma had worse balance than those with normal vision. We did not find that people with AMD had any difference to their balance compared to people with normal vision. Now, what about longitudinal studies? Um, so up to this point, I've just been talking about cross-sectional research. Um, you know, longitudinal studies are important when you're trying to say that something like vision loss causes something else. So, um, you know, if something's causing something, it's there before the onset of the disease or the, the problem. And so ideally you'd have uh, longitudinal evidence saying, all right, these people have vision loss and over time their balance is, is getting worse. Now there aren't a lot of longitudinal studies that look at this. Uh, a couple of studies that did uh, found no association between visual acuity and change in balance. So they, that was the only measure of visual function that these studies had. Uh, you can see they're rather small sample sizes, so that could have played a role. Uh, one study that did find an association, one longitudinal study, was using the EPIs data. So that stands for established populations. Um, Oh, now I'm forgetting what it is, but it's it's a famous study uh, done in the United States. And the great thing about the EPIs data is that um, they included in institutionalized people uh, in their sampling frame. And so when you have institutionalized people, you actually can get enough people who are who are blind uh, to study them as a, as a separate group. And so what they found was that very severe vision visual acuity loss, uh, like blindness, was associated with developing more mobility limitations, which included balance loss. So if I had to summarize the literature, I would say there, there haven't been a lot of longitudinal studies that have looked at this. And the longitudinal studies have been a bit conflicting. Uh, some of the studies had small sample sizes, uh, so they may have been a bit underpowered. And some of the studies on eye diseases didn't have a comparison group of people with normal vision. Um, and then there weren't, uh, I didn't find studies where they compared people with cataracts with people without cataract. There are some studies looking at cataract surgery, which I'll talk about later, and some studies that look at simulated cataract. So what I wanted to do in the CLSA was look at the longitudinal relationship between visual acuity and eye disease with the onset of balance problems. So my conceptual framework is shown here. So I wanted to look at visual acuity or eye disease at uh, let's say baseline. And then I wanted to look at a group of people who, who had good balance and then developed bad, worse balance. And so over this was over a three year period. And so whenever you're using observational data, you need to account for confounders. So confounders are variables that are associated with both your exposure, so the vision loss and the outcome, so the balance problems, but are not in the causal pathway. And so the biggest variable that you always have to worry about when you're doing aging research is age. But other variables that we looked at included um, smoking and sex and body mass index and health conditions like diabetes and stroke and uh, limitations in activities of daily living, which represent disability. 
So we used the comprehensive cohort of the CLSA. So this included 30,097 adults ages 45 to 85 uh, from across the country. And we used the comprehensive cohort because visual acuity was measured at the data collection site in the comprehensive cohort. And so the baseline and follow-up data were separated by three years. And just, just keep in mind who is in the CLSA versus who is not. So people were excluded from the CLSA if they were in an institution, if they were living on a First Nations reserve or settlement, were in the Canadian Armed Forces, did not speak French or English, or had obvious cognitive impairment at baseline. And so these are, this is a map of the different data collection sites, and you can see they're spread very nicely across the country, uh, but not, nothing in the far north. And so people were randomly sampled using provincial health registries, along with random digit dialing, and stratified sampling was done to ensure adequate representation of various demographic groups. And so visual acuity was measured using the chart shown here, which is called the ETDRS chart. Uh, this was uh, two meters from the participant, and it was measured uh, binocularly, so with both eyes open, as well as monocularly, so one eye at a time. Um, and people wore their normal corrective lenses for distance it, uh, when they took the test. And then the scores were converted to LOGMAR, which uh, stands for log of the minimum angle resolution. And this is the way acuity is uh, analyzed. Um, and so a, a logmar of zero would be equivalent to 2020 vision, and a logmar of one would be equivalent to 2200. And so one line on this chart, which is five letters, uh, would equal 0.1 logmar. Participants were also asked if a doctor had ever diagnosed them with the following, so cataract, glaucoma, and macular degeneration. If they said they had cataract, they were asked if they currently had a cataract. And so if people said no, we assumed that they had had cataract surgery. Balance was assessed using the one-legged stand test. And so this test has shown good reliability. Um, and it's also predictive of injurious falls and incident disability. And so what people did, first of all, they were excluded if they could not stand unassisted or if they used a cane or a walker. Uh, and then they removed their shoes and they stood one meter from a wall and raised the right leg up to the calf of the left leg and put hands on waist. And then they repeated for the other leg. And so they were asked to do this for at least 60 seconds and then the timer was stopped at 60 seconds or the timer was stopped when a person lost their balance, like they had to put their leg down or if they touched the wall. And so we used the better time of the right and left legs in the analysis. And so uh, the demographic variables uh, were collected by self-report, uh, same with smoking. Um, body mass index was measured, so height and weight were measured and uh, put into kilograms per meter squared. And then we categorized body mass index just because it often has a nonlinear relationship with various health outcomes. And so uh, our reference category was what's considered to be normal weight. So that's 20 to 24 kilograms per meter squared. And then we looked at health conditions uh, that we thought would be particularly relevant to both vision and balance. And uh, so like stroke and diabetes, and we looked at um, limitations to activities of daily living in a yes, no way. So if anyone said that they could only do certain activities with help or not at all, then we said they had limitations in ADL. So these are activities like getting dressed or eating or walking or getting out of bed. And so if people failed the balance test at baseline, they were excluded because we were interested in the new onset of balance problems. And we defined uh, uh, our outcome in terms of two groups. So did they fail, meaning they could not stand for 60 seconds at the follow-up uh, data collection, or did they not fail? They, they could stand 60 seconds. We also did a sensitivity analysis. Instead of using 60 seconds, we used 30 seconds. And so with a dichotomous outcome like this, we used logistic regression. And we accounted for the complex study design uh, within STATA using the SVY prefix. 
And so I just want to talk about who exactly is in my analytical sample. So there are 30,097 people in the, the comprehensive cohort. Some of them did not return to follow up for various reasons. Uh, some of them did not take the balance test at baseline. So they, um, they may have been using a cane or a walker, for example. Uh, and then a number of people, like just under 50%, failed the balance test at baseline. So they are not in our sample because we're interested in the new onset of balance problems. And then some people were missing data on balance at follow-up. So when you take away all those groups, you end up with 12,158 people. And so that is our analysis sample. Now, um, I just want to show the distribution here of the better leg time on the baseline balance test. So those of you trained in statistics will note that this is not a very pretty distribution. Uh, it's very far from normally distributed. It is truncated at 60 seconds and about half the people at baseline were were able to stand at least 60 seconds. So if you were to use linear regression on a distribution like this, um, that would not be advised. Uh, we chose to use logistic regression with a cutoff at 60, but of course that means we're losing some information on those people who stood for less than 60 seconds. Um, so we we chose to dichotomize, the, dichotomize this. Uh, if you're interested in, in doing analyses on balance in the future, um, I just learned recently that there's a type of regression for truncated data, and so that might be something you'd want to look into. All right, so um, first of all, I want to compare who's in my analytical sample to who's not in the sample. So <clears throat> these are people who <clears throat> either failed the balance test at baseline or did not return to follow up. And so <clears throat> not surprisingly, um, these people are quite a bit older. Uh, they're more likely to be obese and to have health problems. They did have somewhat worse vision. So uh, you can tell that by comparing the logmar. So um, as I mentioned, a logmar of, of zero is 2020 vision. If it's negative, then that means they have uh, vision better than 2020. And as it goes closer to one, vision is getting worse. <clears throat> and they were also somewhat more likely to have eye diseases like cataract, AMD, and glaucoma. <clears throat> Okay, so now let's compare uh, in the analytical sample, the 12,158, who passed the balance test at follow-up compared to who failed the balance test at follow-up. So 22% of people failed the balance test at follow-up. And so they, just like the previous slide, they were older, they were more likely to be obese, <clears throat> they were more likely to have health conditions. <clears throat> And some of you might be interested in the proportion who failed the balance test by age group. So in the, the lowest age group of 45 to 54, about 10% failed the balance test. And in the oldest age group, more like 65% failed it. So you know the ability to do this test uh, does decrease with age. All right, so now let's look at uh, vision variables and its their relationship with failing the balance test at follow up. So people who had um, people who failed the balance test had worse visual acuity. Uh, they were more likely to have cataract either in the past, meaning they had cataract surgery uh, currently, or we had a group of people who, when they were asked, "Do you still currently have a cataract?" They did not know, and so there were so many of them that we made a separate category because we didn't want to exclude them all. And so uh, that's what that group is there. And so all three of those groups, um, they, they have a higher percentage in the, in the people who failed the balance test. Um, and then people with AMD and glaucoma were slightly more likely to fail the balance test. And so what about when we use regression? So, um, you know, we, we want to adjust for age, certainly, and these other factors as well to make sure that any relationship between vision variables and balance is not due to confounding. And so when we use logistic regression, we saw an odds ratio of 1.15. Uh, it was statistically significant because the confidence interval excludes one. And so the way you interpret this is that for each line, uh, 
worse that someone performs on the visual acuity test, they have a 15% higher odds of failing the balance test at follow-up. <clears throat> okay, so what were the odds ratios for the other variables in the model? So I'm showing um, everything except stroke and province are not being shown here. Everything else is being shown on the screen. And so uh, older age was associated with failing the balance test, uh, female sex, uh, current smoking, um, both being overweight and obese was associated with failing the balance test. Uh, per, uh, type 1 diabetes has a very high odds ratio. Type 2 diabetes is also statistically significant. And people with ADL limitations are more likely to fail the balance test. So what about when I add the eye disease into the model? So you know, we don't have acuity in the model. We just have the eye disease. Uh, we want to know if people with cataract are more likely to fail the balance test. And our results for cataract were sort of surprising. So I expected cataract to be associated with failing the balance test, and it was with an odds ratio of 1.31. I did not expect the group who said they did not currently have a cataract to have uh, an increased odds of failing the balance test. They actually had the highest odds ratio. Uh, and then the group with the status unknown, they, there was no association. What about AMD? So with AMD, we did not see any association. Uh, the odds ratio was very small at 1.05 and was not statistically significant. And uh, with glaucoma, we did not see an association, uh, also not statistically significant. <clears throat> All right, so we did some sensitivity analyses um, just to see, well, what if we use a 30 second cutoff? Do we, you know, it, it, are the results sensitive to what, cutoff you pick. And basically, the results were essentially the same when using a 30 second cutoff. Uh, we also looked at whether cataract surgery remained associated with balance after adjusting for visual acuity. And cataract surgery remained associated, but current cataract did not. Uh, we also looked at whether cataract surgery remained associated with balance after adjusting for other eye diseases like AMD and glaucoma, and it did. All right, so let's just summarize what we found here. So um, we found uh, in agreement with many cross-sectional studies and the Ostfield longitudinal study, we found that visual acuity was associated with failing the balance at follow-up. And so this is really important because a lot of uh, visual acuity loss is probably easily treatable uh, due to refractive error or cataract. And so if, if we can improve the visual acuity of people, we may also improve their balance. Now, why was there an elevated odds ratio for cataract surgery? Now, we went through a number of potential explanations. Ultimately, we were not able to explain why there was an elevated odds ratio for cataract surgery. Let me just talk about some of the explanations that we thought about. So, we thought maybe there could be an elevated odds ratio for cataract surgery because maybe people were in between their first eye cataract surgery and their second eye cataract surgery. And so they had a, a real difference in visual acuity between their two eyes. And so we tried adjusting for the difference in the monocular visual acuities and thinking that if that were the case, the association between cataract surgery and balance would go away. It didn't go away, so we don't think it had to do with that. <clears throat> we also thought, well, maybe people have had, you know, both of their eyes operated, but they still have uncorrected refractive error. Maybe uh, the surgeon was not able to remove all of their refractive error. And so we adjusted for binocular visual acuity. And again, the association with cataract surgery did not diminish. We thought, well, maybe they have other ocular disease besides just cataract. <clears throat> and, and perhaps that other ocular disease is causing that cataract surgery uh, odds ratio to be elevated. So we tried adjusting for AMD and glaucoma. That did not make any difference. But of course, we don't have data on other types of eye disease. <clears throat> We try, we thought, well, maybe it has to do with other health related differences. You know, we adjusted for uh, differences in ADL limitations as well as stroke and diabetes, and that didn't have any effect on the odds ratio for cataract surgery. Maybe there, there are other health related differences that we're unaware of. Uh, maybe it has to do with misclassification. So we are relying on self reported 
uh, data for cataract and cataract surgery. Maybe people thought they had cataract surgery, but they didn't. Uh, so that's one possible explanation. <clears throat> and then finally, um, perhaps people who had cataract, uh, even the cataract removed by surgery, have worse vestibular balance. And so <clears throat> there's actually some uh, evidence for this explanation by Pradeep Ramalu's group at Wilmer. Uh, they looked specifically at vestibular balance by having people stand on a compliant surface, meaning like foam, with their eyes closed. So the only sensory system they had to help maintain their balance was the vestibular system. And they found that people with vision loss, either due to refractive error or eye disease, both groups had worse vestibular balance than people without vision loss. And so it could be that, you know, something about having cataract for a while uh, distorts the vestibular balance system. And then even after the cataract's removed, perhaps it, it doesn't go back to normal right away. And so, you know, those are some possible reasons why we saw an elevated odds ratio for cataract surgery, uh, but they require more investigation. Ultimately, what we really need with the CLSA is to be able to confirm whether cataract surgery occurred as well as confirm the occurrence of other ocular disease like AMD and glaucoma. And we need to do that using by linking to health administrative data. Um, this is something that I want to do, but it requires funding. Now, our finding is consistent with uh, a study done in Australia using health administrative data. It was a retrospective cohort study. And what they found, they didn't look at balance, but they looked at the risk of an injurious fall requiring hospitalization. And they found that the risk of that doubled between first and second eye cataract surgery when compared with the two years before first eye surgery. So they didn't compare to people who didn't have cataract surgery. They compared to the period before a person had their first eye cataract surgery. Now, I'm not so sure about the study design. Um, it seems like a design that could be a bit prone to selection bias because if you did have an injurious fall requiring hospitalization, you might not have gone on to get cataract surgery because you were in bad shape. You know, you, you weren't uh, strong enough to get that surgery. And so I'm not so sure about their study design, but it is consistent with what we found. They also found an increased risk of injurious falls after second eye cataract surgery. <clears throat> But our finding was not in agreement with other studies. So uh, there has been a randomized controlled trial where they looked at expedited cataract surgery compared to uh, usual time cataract surgery. And they found that those people who had expedited cataract surgery had a reduced risk, not of a first fall, but of a second fall. Uh, our results are not in agreement with a study by McGuinn, which showed um, they found no association between cataract surgery and the self-report of falls or balance problems. Obviously, self-report is not as good as measuring a balance problems. And it's not in agreement with a study by Schwartz, which looked at postural stability after cataract surgery. And they found that it improved uh, when people had their surgical eye open compared to what it was before the cataract surgery. So to conclude, I just wanna say, you know, uh, cataract surgery is a very safe and effective surgery. In no way am I saying people should not get cataract surgery. Cataract sur you should definitely get your cataract removed, um, but it is important to further investigate our finding. So <clears throat> there are, uh, there's been a lot of research done looking at interventions that can be used to improve balance. Um, and so this is just one systematic review that looked at various exercise interventions. So things like Tai Chi and yoga and strength training, uh, these things have all been shown in clinical trials to improve balance in people. And so these are things that could be suggested to people who have vision loss. So the strengths of this research include the longitudinal study design with the three years of follow-up, the very large population-based sample, and the measurement of visual acuity and balance. 
the limitations are that there was no full ophthalmological exam uh, or access to medical records or health administrative data. So eye disease status was based on self-report. Also, we only have uh, measured visual acuity. So there's no data on contrast sensitivity or, or visual field, which are also very important measures of visual function as it relates to mobility. And the data on cataract um, you know, is limited. We, we don't know. Um, you know, we don't have eye level data on cataract, we just know at the person level, and many people did not know whether they still had a cataract in the eye or not. <clears throat> and so, um, as far as clinical significance of this work, I think more attention needs to be paid to potential balance problems in older adults with vision loss, because there are interventions available that can improve balance and that should be considered. And so if you're interested in learning more about this work, it has been published in the American Journal of Ophthalmology a few months ago. And I'd like to acknowledge my co-authors, particularly my students, Zaina Cahill and Alyssa Grant, and uh, my clinical collaborators, Drs. Aubin uh, and Caraguat in, in Montreal and Dr. Berman in Ottawa. And uh, so the data sets that were used to conduct this analysis are listed here. And I'd like to acknowledge the principal investigators of the CLSA, Drs. Reina, Wolfson, and Kirkland. And I'd be happy to take any questions now. Great, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Freeman. I do, we do have a few questions that came through the uh, chat box, the Q&A box at the bottom. Um, again, if you have any questions, please uh, submit them there and then we can, it's a lot easier to keep track of them in the Q&A box. Um, so the first one um, from Lida Malinowski, uh, ophthalmologists when doing eye exams say they're, say that there are the beginning of signs of cataracts, but they're but that it is not ripe yet. What does that mean? And are eye drops recommended in advance of surgery? Um, yeah, so if someone, you know, a surgery will not be done on a cataract until it reaches a certain state uh, where it's thought to be, um, you know, causing you problems. Um, and so we don't use eye drops for cataract. Um, people, uh, will we'll be signed up for surgery. If, if you did have eye drops, they would probably be to prevent infection uh, before or after surgery. Um, but yeah, if someone were told, you know, you have signs of a very early cataract, would they report that on the CLSA? I'm not sure. Um, or would they only report a diagnosis once their, their cataract is, is so advanced that uh, they're about to have surgery? So that is uh, one of the limitations of relying on a self-report of a uh, disease like cataract, because it is a very slow growing thing. And it's only when it becomes severe enough uh, where it would really be a diagnosis of cataract. Okay. Okay, and another question from Lida. Can you assess the 400 meter walk while using a cane? Um, yeah, so I, you know, assessing the 400 meter walk, you know, you do require access to a track. You know, a lot of times people will do, um, you know, a much shorter walk in the hallway of a, of a hospital. And in that case, I, they might let you use the cane to do that if you felt safe. Uh, certainly for the balance test, they didn't let anybody do the balance test if they had a cane, probably for safety reasons. But yeah, I think you could, uh, I'm, you would want to see what people have done uh, with the 400 meter walk. I'm sure in that paper by Newman, they probably mentioned if they excluded people who used a cane or not, you'd probably want to be consistent with what they'd done. Um, and the next question is from, in the Q&A box is from um, Andrew Patterson. Um, is eye specific, so left or right side data available for cataract? For example, a subject could have cataract in both eyes, but removed in only one. Yeah, so that's one of the limitations. They were just asked, have you ever been diagnosed with cataract? And do you currently have a cataract? So we don't know if you know they had uh, one cataract removed and one still in the eye, or if, if this was the first cataract. So we, we don't have eye level data, unfortunately. We would if we linked, uh, well, no, even, even if we linked to health administrative data, um, you know, you'd have to look for the two separate um, cataract mm -hmm. surgery procedures to know. Okay. 
Okay, and a follow up question to that, um, uh, also by Andrew Patterson. Are time since last routine ophthalmol ophthalmologic exam? I'm not a, my my words aren't coming out right now. It's available okay. in the CLSA. <laughs> Yes, yeah, so there is a variable um, that asks about um, eye care. So have you had eye care in the last year, I believe? Um, and uh, yeah, we've we've worked with that variable before. Okay. Um, okay, I don't see any other questions. I do see a question in the chat. Um, so I'll follow up on that. Can you prevent molecular degeneration? And if so, how? Uh, can you prevent uh, age-related macular degeneration? Um, so that's a good question. Um, so we know that it is highly heritable and there have been a number of genes found to be associated with it, um, but there are also environmental factors that are associated with AMD uh, as well. And so I believe there's research on fish consumption uh, and exercise and, and various modifiable risk factors uh, that you can look at. Certainly, um, uh, yeah, if you wanted to send me an email, I could give you a quick rundown uh, of all the different environmental factors. But yeah, there are things that you could probably do to try to lower your risk, uh, but there is a very strong genetic component. Great, thank you. Um, the next uh, question is, is it possible that the amount of time spent with untreated cataracts contributed to the poor vestibular functions or poor balance in cataract surgery group or the difference in time between left right eye cataract surgery? Yeah, I think that's definitely a possibility. I think, you know, a person could have uh, had, you know, impaired vision due to cataract for many months or even years. And so that may have mm -hmm. affected the vestibular balance system. And so, yeah, it would be great to, to know how long uh, they, they had the cataract and how mm -hmm. disabling it was. Um, that would all be interesting information. But looking, you know, at the connection between uh, eye disease and vestibular mm -hmm. balance is, is, would certainly be interesting. Yeah, and just a comment um, by one of our participants who he says, having had cataract surgery, I can imagine that some of the unsure status might be due to the possibility of recurring cataracts after surgery. So I think that's a good point. So yeah, once the lens is removed and you have the artificial lens, the cataract shouldn't um, come back. Although I think there are complications of cataract surgery uh, where you can need additional surgeries. Um, I would need to, to talk to an ophthalmologist more to, mm -hmm. to uh, talk to you more about that. Okay. Okay. Um, I don't see any more questions, so I think we're going to finish up a little bit earlier. If a, if a last question comes in while we're doing our wrap up, perhaps uh, um, uh, Dr. Freeman can stay on and we can answer it, or we can also she can also follow up to, with you via email. So I'd like to uh, start wrapping it up then by, again, thanking you. Um, uh, we appreciate your participation in the CLSA webinars, both the present our presenter as well as our participants. I'd like to remind you that the next deadline for data access applications is March 30th, 2022. You can visit the CLSA website under data access to review the available data, as well as additional details about the application uh, process. I'd also like to remind everyone to complete their anonymous survey um, upon exiting the Zoom session. Um, uh, if, if it hasn't come up already. Um, and the upcoming CLSA website for your information uh, will be Tuesday, February 22nd at 1 p.m. Um, the, the title will be Examining Mechanisms Underlying the Association Between Adverse Childhood Experiences and Health Outcomes in Mid to Older Aged Adults in the CLSA. And this will be presented by uh, Dr. Divya Joshi, a postdoctoral fellow in the Department of Health Research Methods, Evidence and Impact at McMaster. And you can find registration details on our website, uh, www, um, I think it's on the, on the screen there. Um, and remember, uh, the CLSA promotes this webinar series using the hashtag CLSA webinar. And of course, we invite you to follow us on tw Twitter at, at CLSA underscore ELCV. So that brings us to the end. Um, hopefully we, we see you and uh, or you at least hear us uh, next month for our February webinar. And thank you again to our presenter.
Bye, everyone. Thank you very much.